Right, we're in. Guys, welcome to Shouting from the Sidelines. Delighted to have Aaron Horton with us today. Um, Aaron is an academy level coach. He's now out in Cambodia doing something amazing, which he's going to talk to us about in a second. Um, but Aaron's going to give us a good insight into the academy system in the UK from his experiences. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, over to you, Aaron. Tell us, tell us what you're up to, introduce yourself, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, well, first of all, Luke, thank you for having me on. Uh, I hope it's really insightful for all the players that you've got at Foot Tech there, and hopefully there's a few little takeaways for them. Uh, been a qualified coach since 2002, so probably about 18 years. Did uh, some time coaching back home, grassroots level. was fortunate to go to America when I was about 19, 20, and then did five years there coaching. Uh, worked for a, a big club called Indiana Invaders, just in uh, an area called South Bend. Returned back to England, did some uh, more coaching, uh, did a little bit of futsal work, then the kind of last five years at Leeds United. Three years at Leeds United working in the academy, uh, did all the shadow squads, development centres as well. And I did a BTEC college programme up at Boston Spa, which was 16 to 19 year olds. And then the last two years I've ended up out in Asia. So I did a project for Leeds United in China, which lasted for about two years. Then I've just had a, a move to a team in Cambodia called Visakra FC, uh, which is where I've been the last six months. It's a professional team. And then we have uh, an academy, it's residential. So we've got the under 15s living on site and the under 18s living on site. And then uh, the senior team as well. So yeah, all fun and games. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, that's amazing, sort of worldwide experience as well. And you, you and I met, a couple of years ago on a coach education trip to, to Benfica, uh, which we could talk about for hours because that was, that was unbelievable, but uh, we'll save that for another time. And you said something to me on that trip which really hit home, and, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the podcast. You said what parents don't understand with academy football is there's 12 kids perhaps in the squad. 11 of them are there because one of them might have half a chance of making it. And that was such a powerful statement. And, and again, the reason, you know, one of the big reason why I wanted to get you on to talk about that. Um, so if it's all right, we, I wanted to sort of go through, I guess, the whole process, um, talk about the pre, you know, the pre-process, the scout inside, and then move, move through to, yeah. to, uh, to the academy level stuff as well. So how, how do you first become aware of a, of a player that might have the talent so, I mean, most of the academy clubs, they've got the scouts that will go out to the, the grassroots areas. Uh, the fashion at the moment is to have the development centres and then development centres maybe then into shadow squads and then shadow squads into kind of what they call elites. Uh, I mean, scouts are all over the place at the moment. So, you know, especially in West Yorkshire, it's, it's kind of a hotbed for football clubs. And then uh, you've got your, your bigger clubs as well from, from uh, across the Pennines. So, I mean, the scouts are there from at least, you know, six, seven years old. And they, they are looking for, even at that age, they're looking for their, their talented players to either invite direct to an academy or straight into maybe a, a development centre or anywhere like that. Obviously, they cannot sign until the nine. So then it's kind of a, a balance, maybe going to places like yourself and uh, until they get to nine and they can join the academy such full time and then it's, well not full time, but then it's restricting you from joining your friends at your grassroots team. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, I, with, with the development centre stuff, because these, these things mm -hmm. are cropping up all over the place and there's a lot of, um, in, some, in some ways, a lot of controversy around them as well, not, not regarding Leeds, but there's other clubs obviously uh, one in particular, one Premier League club in particular that decides to have development centres dotted around major yeah. cities like Leeds and so forth. What, do, you, do you think there's a rough percentage of kids that go into these centres that then end up getting into the academies? Or is it just a sort of like a smoke screen almost? Yeah, I think there is a, a degree of fakeness. that I think it varies academy to academy. And like you say, they'll prop up in some towns and then they'll go for a year or two, then they'll go to, they'll drop out and then another one will crop up. It might be a different club. So there is a, a degree of what I'd say fakeness to them. 
my advice to parents would be is you've really got to trust your eyes and by that is it's very hard to get any data on it but as a parent you've got to really observe what's going on uh, is it a sustainable operation uh, are the coaches mindful about my child uh, is it just a numbers game are they just getting a lot of kids in uh, might be a financial gain to the club or is the development center actually connected to the club uh, is there a, a system where players are actually getting sent up to the academy uh, so my message to parents is you know really trust your eyes and kind of look what's going on because every one of these development centers they are a little different and di difference by the people that are running them and by, by the club as well so pay, you've just really got to analyze what you see so yeah 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 i agree um because we have some horror stories sometimes that kids have been told they're playing for this club that club and it's just nonsense it's just utter nonsense but then how do you have that conversation with a parent to say that you've essentially been lied to it's and, and they're paying for the privilege of going to these things as well and it's yeah it's, it's a it's a tough one sometimes it's good advice um so looking at the players then you've you've worked in grassroots as well which is great so you've seen it from both ends what do you think separates a a decent grassroots player to an elite an, an elite level academy player so it's a really good question what i do see in the academies and my experience of you know working around especially uh, as the kids start to get maybe to around 11 12 i do think those in the academies pick up a, a bigger level of confidence Obviously, they've got the prestige of being in that environment and they're picking up kind of good habits in that environment. So I do think there's kind of a, a level of confidence. I don't think there is a, a difference in talent. Uh, no. I think it's, it, it is a kind of a confidence thing that you're kind of getting from being in that environment. Obviously, you're getting more confident in your, your training as well. That you're, uh, you're building up a bigger sense of yourself that, that you should belong in that environment you know, a, a top club really. So, but, but talent wise, I don't think there's any different. And I think the players in the academy might, might have a high ego, but they also have a, a high drive to keep training as well. So it's, uh, it's just a balance really, I think, between the two. I think the ones in the grassroots, they have to have the belief that you, you can get into that environment. So it's, uh, it's, it still is, you've got to keep working at your talent. And I think once you have a taste of the environment, the confidence can go quick, grow quickly. But what's happening is that the guys in the academy that might have been there for two or three years, their confidence has grown quicker and they, they, they get a bigger sense of the, the prestige in that environment. And then would you think, would you think there's any, any actually, I guess at the scouting level then, if, if you've got a scout at, at um, you know, coming from Leeds or whatever, uh, or even such as yourself, if you're at a grassroots game, is there any attributes you might see from a from a grassroots player that you that might make you think? Do you know what we probably need to have a look at that lad or, or girl? Yeah, I mean, I mean, football players stand out to anybody. Uh, I always like the. I mean, as Alex Ferguson, one of his famous ones is they re, used to recruit uh, when they used to do the opposition analysis. They used to ask who's taking the corners, who wants to take the throw-ins, who wants to take the penalties. Who, 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 who embraces the challenge? And I think that's always a good tool for recruiting. I know one player that was very successful at Leeds United and he was actually recruited on the fact that this is when he was playing grassroots, that every time the other team scored, he was the first to go run and get the ball out of the net and put it back on the spot to get playing right. again. So it's not always the things that you think about the player. Attitude can, can count a lot as well. And then... I think, I think skill and technique wise, it's a scout really has to analyze the potential that, that how the player might be once they get into the academy. But I would say attitude can take, take you a long way in that, that kind of scenario. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a massive point. And we, we had this chat a few, uh, a few days ago on, on another podcast about, about that. Um, we were talking to a world champion, Ty Box, who's also a coach. And he was saying that when a child enters their gym, you can tell straight away just by the way they carry themselves, that confidence that, yeah, they might not have the skill level, but 
I bet we can teach them and teach them quickly to get to the level that they need to be at to go into a certain group. And yeah, it's, it's a massive point you've just made there that, that that confidence thing is is huge, really, isn't it? And uh, yeah, that that Ferguson quote's a good one as well, actually. Um, do you think th- there's that old saying about or oh, he or she was born with it? Um, I'm I'm of the belief that it can be developed, that talent can be developed. Um, what's your thoughts on born with it? Yeah, it's. Uh... I mean, the two famous guys, uh, I'm sure you well read, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he's the, the guy that he came up with the 10,000 hours. Mm. And it's really interesting if, if you research him, he was the guy that said, let's do 10,000 hours and you're going to have success. He's actually changed his mindset on it now. And there's another guy who's wrote a really good book. He's called uh, David Epstein. And he's just recently wrote a book called Range. And the idea of range means that you're diversifying, so you're not doing your 10,000 hours. At a young age, you're uh, trying different sports, uh, doing different things in education. And that's kind of the mindset at the moment that you can develop in a lot of different areas. Then when you get older, begin to specialize, uh, kind of a a late teen, then begin to specialize in an area. So that way then you're developing your kind of your talent in different areas. It's, It's not just one fixed area. And then, then you begin, begin to specialize. So the, the talent really can be developed. And I think that's a, a really important message to especially players in your, you know, at foot tech that you, you can develop. And I think that's really important. And, you know, Caroline Dweck, it's the, it's the fix and the growth mindset. I think uh, it's very individual. You have to be kind of what I call a reflective practitioner. So you go to a training session you go to a match and you haven't performed. This is, uh, you know, what I kind of feel is that it's not always down to your coach. A player that can be a reflective practitioner is really going to develop the skill. You know, if if they go home and reflect on the game and and then take the ownership themselves, they're going to really develop the talent. And, you know, somebody like, you know, Ronaldo, he's somebody that throughout his career, he's got a really big ego but he's never forgot about working hard at his talent. And it's something that he's, you know, even now he continues to do. So he's developing his talent every day. And I think he's he's 35 now. So, you know, talent can be developed continuously. And I don't think, uh, I think when you are born, you you do need some kind of fixed attributes, but I would say the kind of the percentage of them is not as big as the talent you can develop. And the good thing about football is a lot of it is in your brain and you can, you can keep maximizing your brain and you can keep learning new things. So yeah, that's kind of, I do kind of, I, I dive, I would say that I'm kind of more diversifying now as I get older as well, that yeah. at one stage in my life, I did think that talent was fixed, but I think the, uh, the David Epstein book, if you get a chance to read that, it's really good. He gives two good examples in that book, and they're both very good, successful examples. Uh, The one he gives is Tiger Woods. So Tiger Woods, he was a a golf prodigy at three years old. He was on the TV, everybody in America knew him. And the opposite that he gives is Roger Federer. And Roger Federer, uh, when he was growing up, he did lots of different sports. You know, he played football, uh, he did basketball. And it wasn't until he got till 16 to 17 that he focused on the, the tennis and became, you know, what he is today. So there's two really good arguments for it, but I would prefer the diversifying approach because I, I, I think that one lasts you in better stead. And if you're comparing Tiger Woods and Roger Federer's kind of careers, obviously Tiger Woods has had all these issues that might relate back to when he was a young child and he's had all the pressure on him. There's yeah. nobody than Roger Federer when it comes to you know elite competition he, he's just such a cool guy and you know but they're both very successful so there isn't no right or wrong way it's just uh, kind of what kind of fits at the, at the right time I guess and you know what's going to make that person successful that so much so much stuff from there like the the multi-sport thing is um 
it, it, it's something we we keep an eye on at the minute. And a few years ago, we started what we class as speed training because we you know we want to make kids faster. Ultimately, we want to make kids move better to help them with their chosen sports. So obviously, we're focused on football, but they they come to us from all other sports as well. And your Tiger Woods example there is very very poignant because. There's so much research gone into the fact that if, if a child specialises in, in a sport at a young age and continues to do that up to late teens into, into adulthood, the, the amount of injuries they could get as a result of doing the same movements again and again and again and again. And Tiger Woods, like you say, as recently in the last sort of four or five years or something, he's not played much golf because of, of injuries. And you just wonder, is that because he never did much else? Whereas Federer... I mean, the guy is a machine. The guy is, you know, he's, he's never injured and things like that. The, the counter to that would possibly be the likes of Ronaldo. Uh, I don't know enough about him. I, I, I want to research it a little bit more to see, did he do anything else? But it, it, there's obviously exceptions to the rules. But generally, it does, it does feel like the multi-sport element is, is so important. You get parents, and you'll have had them as well, that are saying, oh, yeah, we know we're playing. He's playing football. She's playing football six, seven times a week. And I'm just like, yeah you could probably be, be, make, make it more, um, be more beneficial doing something else a day or two a week. And, and I think you'll, you'll start to burn out. You'll start to lose the enjoyment for it, I think, after a while. Um, just having that little release to go and do something else. It doesn't have to be a sport even, does it? It could be, you know, you could just go to a climbing wall or, you know, anything like that, just doing something different. Um, so, yeah, very, very, I'll, I'll get hold of that book. It sounds... Um, it sounds uh, just, you know, for me, uh, if I reflect on my own career, obviously, I was always fixed on football. And uh, my parents, they, they didn't know anything about football. My dad was a runner. And he always used to say to me, uh, you know, why don't you try athletics? But I was like, no, I'm doing, doing football. And if I reflect when I was young now, if I'd have done athletics, like you say, the speed training, going to a professional athletics session once a week, would have helped with my football. But I, I couldn't see that at the time. And then the other one was, I used to do gymnastics like when I was about eight or nine. And how that had helped me with my flexibility and my agility, you know, even scoring a goal, being able to do a flip. So they just things that if I could go back to when I was maybe really young and I know what I know now, I'd, I'd be like, yeah, let's increase my speed for my football. Let's in, increase my flexibility and my agility. It's going to help in my football. But you, yeah. you don't always young age and then just touching on that again there's a really famous basketball player uh, Steve Nash uh, I think he, he played for the, the Phoenix Suns and right. in basketball he was the one when the other team scores he's the I don't know it's either the, I think it's the, maybe the, the point guard I'm not sure but he gets the ball after the other team scored and he, he runs it up the court and then starts to play kind of like a bit like a, a midfielder and he's really successful at it. He's retired now, but he, he played soccer growing up. Uh, he was a very, really good soccer player. And when he got a bit older, he then had to make the decision, do I do the soccer or do the basketball? Yeah, so he's a, a really good example. Of, in another sport, basketball, he's learned to be better in his position by what he's done in soccer growing up. And yeah. it's kind of, you get that kind of in, he's Canadian, this guy, but you get that in America. And he's into his football now. He's actually, uh, he owns the, the Vancouver Whitecaps. He's like a, he's, he's a shareholder there, but he's a very famous NBA player. Interesting. And I've seen, I'm seeing a lot um, now, you've got the likes of Burnley, which I've mentioned before, that, uh, that have got a multi-sport element to their academy curriculum now. And I think it's going to be something that's, that's introduced. And there is, um, there's a good book I'm reading at the minute. It's called The Athletic Skills Model, which is by... Um, it's about two or three coaches that have been involved in Dutch football for a long, long time. And they speak about the athletic side being more important arguably than the technical side. And there's a, there's a quote somewhere um, from, a, from an Ajax coach that give me a fast player with no technique above a very slow player with lots of technique because the technique stuff can be taught. It's not hard. I mean, you go on the internet at the minute during lockdown and there's all these, it's just ball mastery all the time. Anyone that's interested, it's just ball mastery skills, ball mastery. It, you can put a kid on a program for six weeks and have them doing all that stuff comfortably, but speed movement that takes longer. And, and from us doing this training, we found that, yeah, you can develop it, but it develops a lot faster if you're doing other things more regularly. Um, so it, it's, it's an interesting thing. 
And then go, going on, going on to sort of back to the academy side of things, and you, you touched on there, Federer specialising at a later age and things like that. You've seen Bayern Munich recently. They they've just got rid of their. I think it's under nines and under tens. They're they're starting from under eleven now, and the reason they gave was they want kids to do more sport. They want kids to play more and enjoy things more. Um, do you think, hand on heart, that the, the academy side in the UK are they recruiting too soon? Do you think would it, would they benefit from from joining later? Yeah, I think without a doubt they're recruiting too soon. I think probably when me and you were younger, when we played football, uh, I'd say the grassroots one uh, very developed then. I actually believe right now in England, the, the grassroots is developed and kind of the private things like what you're doing. You, you can get what you're getting at a development centre or a young academy in those environments. Uh, I mean, where I grew up, Rothwell Juniors, when I grew there, when I played there, it was, it was just a pitch. But you go back now, they've got a clubhouse, They've got, you can go get changed. The pictures are really nice, uh, got floodlights. It's just a different environment to what it was 20 years ago. And I believe you can still get at a young age, get a good football experience at a grassroots club without kind of trailing an hour away or half an hour away just to get the badge really. So yeah. I think, uh, and doing the multi-sports, like I just mentioned, doing different things, those things are gonna have a, a longer lasting impact as the, the, the child gets older and, and moves forward in the career. So, you know, I, it's one thing when I read about the Bayern Munich one, I, I totally agreed with it. I just think it's, uh, it, it makes sense. And hopefully maybe some academies back home will, will, will see the suit because I think football has a role to play, especially academies, that we shouldn't be putting pressure on the parents, shouldn't be putting pressure on the kids. You know, let the kids be kids and then, then when they are ready, then we can shift them into a, a more competitive environment. It doesn't have to be competitive and leave from, you know, six or seven. It's uh, the kids are not ready, the coach is not ready for that. It's, uh, it's about doing it at the right time. Yeah, definitely. I think that thing there, let, let kids be kids. Um, you, you put them into an academy at a young age and I think it is changing slightly, but there's that, you know, they can't play for a grassroots team, they can't play for the school team. Um, I guess they've got to be careful if they're playing out with the mates in the playground because if they get injured or whatever, that might be it. Um, now, you know, you and I know that you, you meet some some friends through football at a young age that they're friends for life as a result of being able to turn up on a Sunday and, and once a week training on a Thursday or whatever it was. And I bump into people now out in Leeds that I, I've known since I was seven, eight years old, might not have seen them for years, but it's like, it's, it's like you're still best pals and you don't, you, I think, and this is what I wanted to ask you about, about now, Aaron, was what do you think are the, are the main pros and main, and main cons of joining an academy at, at a young age? I think, uh, you know, the pros are, like, like I mentioned before, is you, you are in that elite environment a little earlier. So I, I do think from that comes a kind of a sense of belonging that you belong there. And you're gaining more confidence as you, as you go through the age groups. So I think that is one pro. Obviously, you, get, you do get the prestige of the badge. You can uh, go to school and tell your friends, you know, that you, you play at that club. So there, there is a little prestige. You get the facilities. I do think some grassroots clubs, not as good as the academy, but the, the facilities are at the end of the day better. The pitches are better. And... In the environment as well, I don't know if you've been to Liverpool's, but on the, the wall, all the inspiring messages that they have, it, it's really a, a place where you can see why the young players are really connected to the environment. There's lots of little messages there reminding them about where they are and what they're doing there. So overall, I think if it is done right, the, the academy system, it, it does have a lot of positives. I think yeah. one, one of the kind of the negatives is that that environment is a little fake and it's you turn up to training and the coach has laid out all the bibs for you, the pitch is perfect and you've got a little board with everything on, uh, you've got the perfect kit, you're indoor, the weather's perfect and I think what happens when you're in this perfect environment for three or four years, you, you start to think that's normal and mm -hmm what it's not preparing you for 
is a, a diverse, diverse environment because what you'll find is when you get older, even at whatever level you're playing in football, football's not perfect. So a kind of a negative for me would be as the academy developed a real mindset of grit and determination and have the players within the academy failed enough that would be a because it's kind of it's all kind of all perfect all the way through uh, and I think then you get down to is the majority of players if we face facts the majority of players do get released and like we, we started the topic with the conversation with is that you only need to do the maths so whatever professional team it is there's 11 players you know you've got another 20 in your reserves 20 in your under 18s 16 in your under 16 six and you go all the way down then players in the senior in the first team are going to be there for maybe 10 years if they're doing good so you only have to do the maths to get in the first team it's very hard and i think i don't know the correct figures but what i've read before is it's it's less than one percent it's like 0.1 percent and the hard part is probably getting in, but then the second part is once you're in, are you going to stay there? So you might spend all your life getting to the top and then you might just drop off a cliff because there might be a change of coach. There might be a change of environment. You might be moved on. There's all different factors. So I think that's, a, for me, it's a real big negative. And what happens then is when you do get released is because you've been used to this environment, what you call your, your coping range is you can't cope with it because, and that's what happens then is the, there's quite high levels of participation dropouts when you get to 16, 15, because people have been through this academy system. It's all they know. And then when they leave, it's just too much for them. So they don't even like football because they don't have the skills to cope with anything different now because, because they've been in that environment. So, I think if it's done right, it, it, it can, you know, you, I think Liverpool's a good example, but I think if it's done wrong, it can, it can have some serious harm on young people and affect kind of how they live the rest of their lives. You know, I still meet some friends now that kind of were at academies and then it put them off football. And I just think that's such a shame that they were put off football by, by something that they actually love, but they've just been damaged so much by it. And I have a, a friend and he cannot even watch the football on the telly anymore because it just hurt him that much, what the academy did to him. So, I, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a really good question, really good question. It's, it's funny because you said before we went on air that in, in many ways you might contradict yourself slightly with some of the things that you're saying, but it's all, it's all relevant stuff. And, and the, the ultimate thing with this is there is no right or wrong answer and it is very individualistic towards the child. And you look at the likes of, say, Marcus Rashford, who's just burst onto the scene in the last few years. Now, he's coming from an environment, I think he was at Fletcher Moss in Manchester, which is known as a, as a, as a grassroots club. They've not got loads of money, but they, the amount of um, players that have gone pro from there, that have gone into to the United Academy, the Man City Academy, and moved into the, the pro leagues in some way, shape or form, is astronomical. And you wonder... Have they, have they developed that grit in those places when it is, you know, it, it's, like a, it's like a rocky gym, isn't it? It's like a spit, a spit and sawdust boxing gym, but the football equivalent where, you know, they, they've, they've gone into a training session. Not, not, it's not all laid out and all pretty for them. It's, it's just it's almost street football in, in many ways. And, and going back to its rawness, which is brilliant. And you wonder, players like that, do they have a better chance of making it than those that have maybe been picked from four or five year old because they can do a few kick-ups and have just known that environment, that nice, like you say, it's all indoors, it's wonderful and they've not had like a Saturday morning with us when it's snowing and wind and <laughs> everything else. And, and you wonder, has that helped them? You know, and you think about the South American players that come over because as you rightly said, you've got these players that are in the first team um, but then you've also got the fact that, the, that these pro clubs can go buy players from here, there and everywhere. And you look at the South American players that are coming from nothing in many ways, you know, living in slums in Brazil or whatever. They've had to fight, fight and fight to get to where they are. They aren't going to let their place go. Um, mm -hmm. And they've had these different experiences to some of our kids that is in many ways is, is football 
a youth level? Is it becoming a little bit more, um, you know, middle to upper class almost now? Because I think some people can't get to these academies. Some kids can't get there. Can they don't have the parental support or whatever? It's probably another another uh, conversation for another time. But the the, the one th- you, you touched on a couple of points with that, where which is what I wanted to ask you: the dangers of a child going to an academy who clearly isn't ready clearly isn't ready you, you mentioned that they might fall out of love with, with football um you know it is in your experience is that have you, have you seen that happen have you have you seen the kids come to to some of your sessions perhaps that you're just thinking this is going to do more harm than good yeah yeah sorry i've just gone a, a bit off the house you still hear me okay yeah yeah i can hear you just gone a bit connection's gone a bit low yeah no i think uh the uh the academy system should have a, a real duty of care to really, when they're getting all these players in for trials, they should be able to uh, explain the process a little better. And I don't think that always happens because obviously I see, especially at the young, young ages, it's just like a cattle market, you know, the scouts and the recruitment guys, they're, they're looking at maybe you know, sometimes maybe a hundred players a week in all the development centers. And I think sometimes you can lose that personal touch that you really need to have that connection with a player and the parents and explain kind of actually what's going on in that situation. So, yeah, and I, I, obviously there's, there's players that go into development centers and then before I've seen them, they don't want to come back or they don't want to go back to the academy. I've seen it happen on numerous occasions or maybe they'll go to a, another club where they'll, they'll have more success. Maybe that club's took a bit more time, a bit more care. So th- there's all different factors. And I just wanted to touch on what you said about grit, really. And you think, uh, I do really think what you said, that football kind of the academy system is becoming a bit middle class. You know, most of these clubs, the training ground, it's not near the stadium in a, in a city area. It's out of town. So your parents have to drive, they have to have a car, they have to have a financial commitment to get you there through the weeks. So you can look at maybe some of the inner city areas in England where they're, they're kind of maybe talent hotbeds because the, the kids there have got a real hunger and it's a, a different type of hunger to the kids that are already there because they, they've seen a different side of maybe life, a kind of a, they, they know how tough it is to uh, get recognised and they might have, uh, want to do it a little bit more for the family. They've got that uh, drive and mm. success that they, they really want to do it. And obviously everybody loves Alex Ferguson and when you research him, before every single game, he always reminded the players where they'd come from and he, he used to look around the dressing room and most of the players that he'd recruited, they, they came from backgrounds, council estates, South America, in, in, in poverty really. And he always connected them before a match to, to what they were doing and obviously had real success for him. So I think that there is a, a big correlation there. I don't know if there's any research done on it. And yeah. only because I, you know, like everybody, I wanted to be a professional. And because I've worked in a professional role in football now, if I reflect on my own career, I didn't do enough because when I was in America, I I met a guy and he'd actually come over from Brazil to America and he lived homeless and he just wanted to get get to an American team. And and I just remember thinking, wow, like I was no, I had nowhere near that grit. Would I, would I have gone that far to achieve my dream? And when you kind of, cause I've worked around the world, you, you see football very different. Like you said, you, you see players in Africa, you get emails all the time, South American guys, like it's just such a massive, massive thing, what everybody's trying to do. So yeah. you just you a different mindset. You don't have that mindset when you're, you're 16, you don't know what, what everybody else is doing, but there's always going to be somebody more hungry than you. So, you know, it's really how much do you want it to, to achieve something in that environment? That's it. It's um, like we've said, and that's the beauty of football, really. You can't really bottle up a process, can you? I think if we all could tap into what um, what Messi has and how we the process he followed to get there, but it's just impossible. Everyone, everyone's different. The mentalities are different, but there's there's certainly similarities with players that end up making it and going on to bigger and better things. And I think it is 
it's not just a talent, it is that mentality as well. Um, it, it's massive points. And it, I think with the parents, going back to the thing about the academies and are you ready for it and stuff like that, the amount of times we get asked, oh, you know, could, could, could you get them a trial? Could you get them a trial? And it's, it's hard to talk to them sometimes to say, you know, look, he, he or she isn't good enough. And, th- th- and you want to say that to them. And, you know, you've, you've just got to be as polite as you can with it because the last thing on this good earth that I would want to do is destroy somebody's love of football. Like you said, with your friend that can't even watch the game anymore. Um, imagine sending a kid to an academy for a trial on the basis that the parents being quite pushy that kid just sees that he's completely out of his depth or she's completely out of his mind. And that's why I was keen to ask you those questions, Aaron, because you know, we've had it recently and, and you have these parents, you have these parents that they'll come to us for a little bit and then they'll join a team and then, and then you'll just see them popping up in all these different places because they're waiting for that, that one or, or trying to get that one place that'll say oh yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll send them for a trial and he just it, it's this is why i was so keen to talk to you because they need to understand go on sorry i lost you a little bit i think it's your connection Hang on. go on you're back aaron yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> sorry, mate. Yeah, so did, did you? Did you? I, I can edit all this out, by the way, so don't worry. Um, where did you lose me when I says they don't understand the damage it causes? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I can carry. On. Yeah, I yeah, my so. thoughts. Uh, I think the the best analogy I can give you is that if we imagine a car, the the child has to be driving, and the the child has to be even at a very young age. The child has to be making the decisions. And as parents, uh, I think the best word is, is mindfulness. And the, the mindfulness has to be really connected to the child and having a real good sense of what the child is emotionally at that time. And mm-hmm. let, the, let the child drive the career, let the child drive where they want to go. You know, if the child wants to go for there for a trial, then yeah, by all means help them. But let it be the child that's the driving the approach, I think is, uh, is, is really key. And I think the best thing that parents can do is just, you know, and I know that parents are, but is be really emotional connected to your child. And you have to, you cannot view your happiness on something that's going to happen in the future. So you cannot think, oh, if my kid gets signed up at this club, that's going to make us really happy as a family. The, the happiness should be in the journey and, you know, going to the training sessions and re- rewarding the effort. And I think it's a big risk if you're going to base your happiness on something that you have no control over. You, you really have no control over. The only person that does have a little control over it is your child. So, you know, let, let them drive and uh, let them navigate their career. And it's... Uh, and the enjoyment should be in supporting them on the journey. And, uh, yeah, because, you know, we see all the time. And I know you asked for some funny things. I mean, I've, I've seen CVs for nine-year-olds uh, <laughs> um, telling me, uh, you know, Little Tommy Does Magic Shows was on one CV. That, that wasn't his name. But so, you know, trying to really push, push it. And I think like we talked about, if you do create the right environment to, for the child and th- they should be allowed to fail, that it, it will happen and it, it will happen in its own way. And mm. the, you say there's, there's enough football clubs, there's enough scouts, you know, if it's going to happen, it will happen. And so I just think it's, uh, the emotional intelligence is a big thing. And I always remember playing myself and they don't do it now, but it was when you went from like the, I think about 11, you went from a five-a-side pitch to an 11-a-side pitch, which for me, I was a little, not small, but I felt the pitch was really big. It was too big for me. And I'd been like the best player in five-a-side. And then I'd gone on to the 11-a-side pitch and it was just a different game to me. And I couldn't get a touch at all. 
And not one coach or anybody asked me, you know, I, how are you feeling right now? And it kind of did kind of affect me a little emotionally that I kind of didn't know kind of could get back to speed with a game. And it was only kind of my mum, she said, you know, my dad had watched the games and it was my mum, she, she said, Aaron, did you enjoy that? And I was like, no, I couldn't get the ball. So it's just uh, really having that emotional intelligence to, uh, you know, observe your child and, you know, let them drive and let them be happy. Let them be happy, yeah. You've probably answered the question. The last one I wanted to ask you was, when you do have children, um, if you do, would you, would you put them through the academy system, knowing what you know about it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it really depends on the environment. And like I said, uh, you have to assess it with your own eyes. And you have to assess what's happening there. Is it the right environment for your child? I think one of the big factors for me is we, we have to allow the children to fail. And I think in the kind of the competitive system in academies, I don't really believe that failure is recognized because if you're going through a dip, that, that's when the, the eyes are on you. And that is really the time when you need the support and the extra development. So I do think it depends on the environment, if it's done right. And like we talked about a few things, for me now, I think the, the, the broad range of activities is the, the best way forward to, to, to develop a child. And that's sporting and that's education as well, because a football career is very short. And even if you do make it professional, at what level? And through, through my journey in football, uh, obviously I grew up with friends that have made it professional and they've actually wanted to stay in the game but they haven't had the skills then when they've left football to stay in it or the skills to go into a different career and I've kind of in the football period kind of passed them in, in my journey in football because I've, I've took kind of a generalist route where I, I have done different things and uh, had different influences I haven't just been focused on being a professional footballer that has had a better stead in, in my longer outlook on life. And I think one of the things that, again, is important is the, the child really has to develop themselves. And it, it's easily said, but it means that is that child really have a sense of who they are? And I think in football terms, it's kind of the way you play the game and your creativity. Now, those types of things, they come from different experiences, different environments. What kind of I've seen from my experience in academy environments is we kind of do create like uh, clones. You know, everybody's trying to yeah. do what they think is necessary, maybe for the coach sometimes. And, you know, maybe for the academy system, you know, I think scanning is a typical one that, you know, it's, it's, it's hammered into players. And you see like kids running around, like looking over the shoulder, like every two or three seconds. And I'm not saying it's not a right or wrong thing to do, but is it needed in the context of the game and or in, the, in the kind of situation? Like the kids just develop that skill to please the coach or to please what they think is going to be work in the academy. And I think once you have a, a stronger sense of yourself, you can be more creative, uh, develop different techniques because th there's no right or wrong way to play football. And sometimes the most creative pass or the most creative skill, that might be something that only you have thought of and it's not come from any academy, it's not come from any coach. And that kind of level, that kind of attribute, it has to be really embraced in a, an environment where you can fail and yeah. so yeah that'd be my thoughts I don't have kids yet so we'll <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's massive massive points again though with regards the yeah the environment and and things like that it's not just oh yeah he's in an academy now she's in an academy now it, it's are they in the right one and mm -hmm. and if not then it could do them more harm than good and yeah the, the scanning thing is interesting which is it's maybe a 
a, a separate podcast that when we talk a little bit more about the coaching itself. But yeah, just doing things to please people, where as opposed to doing it when required, it's a great skill to learn. But they need they need to know when to do it, don't they? Not just to oh yeah, I've done that. Coach Steve will be happy with me now. It, it's it's a little bit of a nonsense and. You've got that six-week block, haven't you, normally, every half term when they get the letters to say they're coming back or they're not. And that's the thing. It doesn't really reward learning from failure, does it? Because if you fail for that whole six weeks, you're probably not going to come back, even though you were in a position to probably go on to be, to bigger and better things. But, um, Aaron, that's been brilliant. I think for any parent, you know, whether or not you're in, interested in football, I think just to listen to what you've said about a child moving into a more professional environment in any sport, it, it, superb, some absolute gold there for them. And I can't thank you enough for, for your time. Um, amazing to hear what you're doing in, in Cambodia. I look forward to catching up with you on that when, uh, you know, in further down the line. But uh, I really, really appreciate your time, mate. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem, Look, uh, All the best to you and all the best to everybody at Foot Tech. I know I've been watching all the videos, so I, I hope your players are working hard and... If anybody, when they get older, they want to come to Cambodia, if I'm still here, they'll, they'll be more than welcome. <laughs> All right. Thanks, mate. All right. Cheers, Paul.